Okay, um, hello and welcome to Level 5 Health and Social Care. Um, and this is Unit 505, which is about putting together a research project. Okay, so um, we're starting off with Week 1, which is the theoretical perspectives be behind research and developing a research question. So we're, we're going to be addressing, um, if you look at the criteria for this unit, we're going to be addressing criteria 1.1 and 1.2 this week. And this particular unit is, is aimed to develop your skills of independent inquiry and your analysis skills. Remember, you are operating at a level five now, most of you um have probably gone through level three and level four of uh, these health and social care uh, courses so you're you're stepping up here so the the level of research and your own personal inquiry needs to be of a slightly higher level a bit more detailed a bit more nuanced okay and to do this this unit um, is asking you to undertake a small pilot study or a little piece of research and it needs to be directly relevant to the health and social care field and again um, the topic is going to be completely up to you to choose but it's got to be relevant to the health and social care field and it's got to be uh, narrow enough to to be able to meet the requirements of the assignment but it's also got to be big enough to be able to meet the requirements of the assignment um, when when I talk you through the assignment in week four, I'll give you a bit more detail about the size of it. But what I'm going to do with these three weeks is to go through all the processes that you need to be doing. Because it's a research project, you will be given a bit longer to do this than uh, one of your normal assignments. OK, and if you are unsure about your topics or the research question that you sort of come up with, then you know if you want to if you want to just sort of mull the ideas over just whatsapp me about that and um you can talk to me about your topic you can talk to me about you know uh, your best ideas it would be great if you could whatsapp it in, in in a group whatsapp because the sort of questions you'll you'll be asking will probably be uh, questions other people will be interested in anyway okay so do remember before you go down the road um of doing your research and then finding out it's not on the market it's better just to run it by me first okay okay so let's get on to uh, thinking about the perspectives now uh, the criteria is asking you to look at the two theoretical perspectives i'm actually going to give you three but there are two specific perspectives and the third one that you'll see is a mixture of the two so um, as i said 1.1 asks you to describe the two theoretical perspectives so focus on the two opposing perspectives i'm going to give you it's a criteria okay first of all let's think about what is a research philosophy and it really refers to the sort of beliefs and assumptions and principles that underlie the way you approach your study and and that could be whether it's you know um a postgrad dissertation um a master's thesis or any other academic or any undergraduate academic research problem remember you're operating at a level five now which is undergraduate level really it's level it's years one and two of a degree okay so uh it, it also the philosophy and the paradigm we'll talk about paradigms in a minute uh, encapsulates the nature of the knowledge that you seek to obtain uh, and and it's sort of the approaches that you use for for example you could find a, a concrete absolute type of answer to your research problem or you might find out something that can't really be calculated we're going to look at that in a little bit so it's about whether you're looking for hard answers or sort of softer answers, really. Both of them are equally as relevant. So don't feel 
that just because you know you've got a lot of soft answers from your research that it's not as good as a piece of research that has you know clear statistics and numbers that is not true the statistics and numbers are relevant for a certain type of question or experiment whereas your qualitative information we'll talk about that a little bit more next week um is more relevant for another type of question so we that will reveal itself a little bit more in the future okay the word paradigm you often hear that bandied about really um it's it's a method model or it's a pattern and in this case it's a research paradigm so it's your model for conducting your research so here the word perspectives or paradigm are interchangeable okay so um we're going to look at the two most well-used perspectives or paradigms if you want to use a more um, classical research uh terminology and we're going to use those look at those two now okay the first paradigm we're going to address is positivism okay and when you think about positivism it's sort of you know gives a bit of a clue in the word it's looking for positive answers really this is your your hard and fast statistics data gathering yes no sort of answers and think about the sort of hard sciences you know um, they're always described as positive um, pos you know or using a positive paradigm physics biology astronomy you know uh, fairly factual it's rooted in the belief that knowledge can be obtained through objective observations so science chemistry you know those sorts of things um, and it's observations and measurements and you can find the answers to your research question by measuring and analyzing data usually uh, numerical so um, this is known you know making use of creating quantitative data remember we've discussed that before quantitative data it's about the numbers really and you know you you often adopt an experimental or at least quasi experimental research design so fairly scientific approach you will recognize a scientific approach so you might you know tr test something out on people you might count the responses um and the aim of it is to be objective you know or to be able to repeat the findings elsewhere a group of 20 people here a group of 20 people there generally this sort of science is expecting to get the same answers in both sets of 20 people or if not finding out what what the differences are so when we say generalizability it means it's something that you can make as a general statement you know um people who suffer from lung disease are in pain you know have pain varying levels of pain is something that might be a different question but the fact that they have it is is a, you know is generally so um, and you can do that quite easy with statistics or um this this medicine works well for this illness um and you you could do statistics how many people have recovered after being given an antibiotic for chest infection those sorts of things very health orientated used quite a lot obviously in the health area positivism okay i'm going to give you an example of that in a minute that related health and social care so here's here's a sort of question that you might find um, useful for that um, you might decide you want to look at the relationship between weight loss and a dietary supplement or a weight loss tablet or something like that so you would do a randomized control trial okay where you would assign participants to either a control group or the intervention group As you, some of you may well have heard from this sort of experiment it's quite common um, so those in the intervention group do get the medicine and those in the control group tend to get a placebo or a pretend medicine they all merrily take it for a month or so or whatever and then you see who's lost weight and you want to prove that the people taking the weight loss medicine have lost weight and 
hopefully the the others haven't or not hopefully for them but um so they don't know that they've been given the placebo if they do lose weight you then start to do maybe some other stuff just to find out what else have they been doing other things as well you know but the idea is is that you set them off with perimeters telling them you know that they just take the medicine and they don't do any additional exercise or they all do the same amount of exercise you know so just think about it like that um and if if it works out the way you want it you can actually infer that there's a causal relationship between the the weight loss and the supplement so you can say that taking this supplement has caused them to lose weight so so as you can see the examples um that that would only work it's got to be a controlled environment you've got to really control all the perimeters what else they do they've got to eat a similar diet as i said they've either got to take no exercise or they've got to take the same type of exercise otherwise it, it, it messes it up these studies are really commonly used in hard sciences um, the research so so much so that very often when they write out their research question they don't even explain that they're taking the positive paradigm positivistic paradigm in their methodology but when you write up the methodology of yours because it's actually identified as criteria you need to actually say as part of your write-up that i use you know the um i use the positive the positivistic paradigm okay so try to remember that um because you'll get the marks for that because it's it's identifying that you've done it so the second uh paradigm is interpretism and it's pretty much the opposite so they are quite opposite to each other so it should help you sort of remember them it would sit more or less on the opposite side um it really takes the position that all reality is socially constructed um that's why this approach is used quite a lot in social studies research. Um, in other words, that your reality is subjective and not objective, and it's really constructed by the people experiencing it rather than the independence of the observer. Okay, so what you're getting here um, is about people's thoughts and feelings about something and my my view when if i was being interviewed might be different from yours if you're being interviewed so we might be part of the same group who are who are being part of this but we might have totally different approaches to it because it's subjective so that's what interpretism feels so <clears throat> it, it believes that the role of the researcher is to try and understand the meanings interpretations that people assign to their experiences so the uh if you're using an interpretivist paradigm you will be using a methodology that's probably more qualitative in approach and your data collection instead of being the sort of organized maybe science experiments and, and you know gathering numbers your your data collection might be sort of interviews observations and you know sitting down in groups with people or um just watching people and listening to what they say or videoing them and things like that these type of studies usually explore more social phenomena really than maybe biology and and um anatomy things like that uh, because social phenomena tends to be more subjective so you might be thinking more about people's behavior rather than you know whether they respond well to a treatment or not okay but let's think of an example of interpretism so imagine if you are you decide you want to do some research uh, to find out people's experience of suffering from chronic pain so you might conduct some in-depth interviews with a group of participants um, you could do a group ones you could be doing individual ones doesn't really matter um, you explain or you could do both um, and you'll be asking quite a lot of open-ended questions in other words getting them to put things into their own words 
think about their pain, to describe it, talk about how it affects their lives, what sort of coping strategies they might use and what their experiences have been like. You'll then transcribe all those interviews, you'll analyse your transcripts and, and you'll be picking out part of your analysis would be picking out reoccurring themes and patterns that are that are coming up so that will give you something to say there'll always be someone in your group that's got a totally different interpretation to the rest and you might want to highlight that as well uh, and then you might want to link it you know that does do people's backgrounds reflect differently do people with a certain background seem to have this approach there's lots of things you can explore in your when you when you've picked out your themes really. But the whole point is you're exploring their subjective experiences. You're not collecting numerical data, and you're not measuring it or calculating it. So you're really about um, trying to understand what people's lived experiences. So if that's the type of research you want to do, then the interpretive interpretive is a, is paradigm is the one for you now it buried in mind you you know the amount of time you've got you this sort of thing can be quite time consuming so you need to sort of be very tight about the numbers of people you're going to interview and stuff like that okay but we'll talk about that a little bit more so those are the two different approaches the interpretivist and the positivist they are the two opposites which you need to write about to answer 1.1. I've just added in um, a third paradigm, which is actually a combination of the two. And it's strangely enough, you might be surprised, pragmatism. Pragmatism is, you know, literally what it sounds like. When you can see that both positions are quite useful, but you want to ask questions that have a bit of hard question and a bit of softness about them you might want to take a more flexible approach you don't want to make it all number data you don't want to make it all questions you might do a little bit of both really it's important as to the sort of research question you developed whether you feel the need to use those and you must and you do find a lot of researchers do take the pragmatic paradigm and that's fine. Um, the most important thing to do is if you've chosen to take the pragmatic approach, then when you're doing your write up and your research, you know, you need to say why. You need to say why the quantitative or the qualitative one is not enough and that you wanted to do a little bit of both, really. Um, lots of studies do take the mixed method approach. Um, it's it's a problem solving way of dealing with things really so it's it's actually quite useful and there's nothing wrong with doing it but it is important that you say at the beginning of your research why you've chosen to do that because obviously you're 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 going from two completely different angles so you need to say and you need to think about why you're cho choosing to do that as well so and it would really be on the question that you develop so I've given an example here. This one's around education, actually. Um, but in the case that you might want to use a new teaching method to improve students' learning, the outcomes of their learning. So you might use a mixed method approach here. OK, so one of the things you could do is after maybe having done your new teacher method for a few weeks, you could um, have a look at your class test and compare them to um, a group that where you haven't changed your teaching method. So maybe maybe I'm teaching two health and social care groups, group A and group B. I could, you know, use the new method with one group and stick with my traditional method with the other group. And then I can give them a test at the end of it and have a look at the scores and see if one group scores higher than the other group. So that's that's your hard, um, your your positive positivist approach, and then I might interview some of the students and find out how they feel about the new method. So 
um, about the method that's being used and, you know, um, get some insight into whether they feel actually works better for them from the way we learned, maybe did classes before. So then I would have some statistics that they're they were actually um, reaching their learning objectives because they you know, passed their tests better. But also I would have some um, insight into whether it was for them as individuals, was it a good learning experience, which would be quite important really, because you know if they pass the test better, but it was a very bad learning for experience for them, they probably won't in the long run. Um, they might just do that time because they're, you know, they happen to be trying for that test, but it can have a negative effect eventually. If they, if they carry on being taught like this, they could end up with the results slipping or something. So you'd really want to get the feedback from the students as well, because that would reinforce your sort of decisions. So just to recap, research philosophies and paradigms, pretty much the same thing or perspectives. They just encapsulate the set of beliefs, assumptions and principles that guide um, what methodology you're going to use, how you're going to develop your, your research plan. Uh, positiv positivism is rooted in the belief that reality is independent of the observer and consequently that you can get all your knowledge by objective observation and measurements. So you're not actually part of it. You just stand away and do, you know, gather your data. Interpretivism takes a much more much opposing position that reality is subjectively constructed by the observer through their experience of it rather than being independent. So it's very much, you know, like that person in the group um, experienced something one way, that person in the group experienced it maybe very differently. And, you know, what are the themes you can bring together about that? Pragmatism tries to find the middle ground as the tries to find out what's the most useful for this research question I've got. Um, rather than an all or nothing, you know, I'm only doing this, I'm only doing that. It says, actually, I'm going to do a bit of this and a bit of that because it answers my question better or more thoroughly. And that's OK when you go off to do your research project, if that's what you choose. But you just need to sort of just justify why you've chosen it, as I said. OK, so that's that's the two theoretical perspectives, really. So now we've really looked at it, you hopefully it will lead you into sort of thinking, well, what, you know, what am I going to do for my study? Now, the important thing to do is you sort of have to work backwards. You can't really decide this until you've really worked on what your actual research question is going to be. And remember, I'm leaving it up to you because then coming out of that, you're going to have to pick a topic and then you're going to have to drill it down into a research question that you can actually um, answer within the time frame that you've got. And that's really important. I'm not asking you to go and, you know, do something that, that's absolutely impossible for you to do within the time frame. So when you're picking your research question or creating your research question, you've got to bring in time, ability, you know, into it as well. So let's have a look at the process of developing a research question. OK. Um, you may think it's quite difficult to develop a research question. Um, the important thing is to remember it's a process. You don't just wake up with a question in your head. OK, um, and that's why we, we use the word developing a research uh, question instead of just saying write a research question. So it's not something you just think up. Um, you, you have a process that gets you to the question that is actually doable for your piece of research. There are five steps and that can this can help you organize your thoughts a little bit. First of all, pick a topic or, uh, as I said, uh, you might well get assigned it. You know, if you're doing something at uni, you might you might get a, a very wide topic given to you. Do a research question on, you know, on on pain management, do a research question on lung cancer, you know, do a research question on obesity. Um, and then you sort of create your topic out of that. 
So step one is to pick a topic, a very wide topic. Step two is to write a narrower, smaller topic that's related to the first. Step three, list some potential questions that could logically be asked. Step four, pick the question you are most interested in. And I would say in um, step four and five, think about your time time scales, your word count, all that sort of thing, because that will tell you how much research to do. If you if you've got three thousand words to write or nine thousand words to write, you know there's room for you to put a lot more research into nine thousand than three thousand. So your question's got to be as big or small as your word count, as the amount of weeks you've been given to do it. OK, so bear that in mind. Step five is revise the question you're interested in so it's more focused. And I would say whenever you when you whenever you come up with a question, make sure you do step four and five. Pick a question and then revise it. Don't just go with the first thing. Always revise it down a bit, sharpen it up, make it more focused. So let's let's have a look at it. There's Something known as the research question triangle, um, which is quite useful. It gives you the sort of following steps. It shows you how many steps you should take, really. Um, as I said, once you know these three steps in the order, there's only three skills that you need to develop a research question. Imagine, uh, the ability to imagine narrower topics about a, from a big one. Thinking of the sort of questions that stem from a narrow topic and then revising those questions to be more specific and focused. And every time you do that, it's important to evaluate what you, you produce. So you keep doing a little evaluation as you go along, um, which is just just your process of rough drafting things, you know. It's something by now you should be able to do, really. You should be able to evaluate. Is this does this answer all the questions I want? Yes, no, no, I've got to I've got to sort of smooth it out a bit more. So look at the sort of little example I've given you. I've started with a general topic. This is um pretty much a sociological question, really. You can do it health related, you can do it care related. It's got to be related to health and social care. But this one happens to be a sociological question. Start with a general topic. So I just decided to start with media violence. Very big, very wide open topic. Get a few books for ideas. Start picking up stuff. So have a look and see what's out there, what people have already um, written about. And coming out of my gathering of books there was quite a lot of stuff about you know children and media um teenagers in media uh all sorts of things like that so i thought okay there's quite a lot of stuff there so i'll narrow it down to a specific question there are teens affected by violent media now that that could still be quite a wide question i don't really have the time or the resources to study such a large question. So I'm going to narrow it down a bit further um, to within my capacity, really. So I'm going to narrow it down to are there any evidence that violent video games? I think I'm going to focus on video games. There's a lot of stuff about video games. There's a lot of stuff about movies. There's a lot of stuff about social media. Um, I don't have the capacity to do the social media question. It's too wide. It's too. It's going to take too long. So I'm just going to need narrow it down to video games. Is there any evidence? So this is a historical sort of question. I'm looking really at the research that's already gone before with this question. Is there any evidence that violent video games? Um, if I had lots of resources, I might create my own evidence, but I also might just look back at stuff and say, OK, reading these three, five, six articles, there is enough evidence here for me to answer that question. 
If you find the evidence is very old, you might want to do something of your own. But again, think about your capacity. After you think of every research question, just evaluate it to see if it meets your needs. First thing you say, is your question not easily answered with a simple yes or no or a quick Google search? OK, if you can find all the information in five minutes and a Google search, then it's it's sort of been answered too much. So that's not a good enough question for you to do for a new piece of research. OK. Um, if it can't be answered with a simple yes or no, there's lots of, you know, this guy's research on that, that guy's research on that. Some contradicts each other. Some depends on different age groups and that. Therefore, there's some substance. So you think, OK, yeah, maybe I can go on and do this. Maybe I might narrow my question down between 14 to 16 year olds or something like that, because I've found this piece of research that that throws up some questions. Part two. Has it got an underlying problem with social significance? Is it relevant to your locality, to the country, or is it an international thing? Therefore, is this question important to somebody other than you? Is this just something you want to know, or you think there's something other people would want to know? And really, to bother to do a piece of research, it's got to be something that really other people want to know. Now, I do know that when people are at post you know doctorate level they often just do things they want to do and, and they publish and then maybe one other person in the world might read it but that's at doctorate level for this sort of question in general in general we want to do research that other people might be interested in as well point three does it pose a genuine question does it avoid using loaded language or suggesting a predetermined answer? So try not to do that. Think about the wording of your question. So you wouldn't write a question saying, do 80% of, of people who use um, paracetamol get rid of their headaches in an hour or something like that? Because it, it says to me that you've probably already got those statistics and you're just trying to prove them correct. You need to ask the question another way. Um, you want to know how, you know, do a majority of people find paracetamol useful? Or, you know, do they use other things? Or what what's analgesia do people find, do the general public find useful to take for headaches or something like that? It needs to be able to be answered with reliable evidence. So it's got to be researchable. You, you can, you've can either got to be able to use the quantitative or the qualitative approach, and, and you've got to be able to access people. Um, and it, it's nice if you've got some other research evidence that you can get from other sources as well. But reliable sources, please, not Wikipedia, because Wikipedia is never verified, OK? So you can't actually guarantee the research that people might be put in there. So they've got to be reliable sources, educational texts, university texts, those sorts of things, textbooks. You know. Has, is the scope appropriate? Therefore, it's not too narrow, not too broad. And you don't want to be left with so much information that you've, you've made your question so big. You've got so much information that you can't either uh, discuss it within the word count, because that will be relevant, or it will take you days just to focus it down, then you know you've got too much information. Um, if you make it too tiny, you know, if you only do something with 10 people, but don't bring in other types of research or other bits of information, 10 people is not enough for me to make a decision about whether that research is correct or not. OK, but it could be part of a wider um, bit of information. So sometimes the first draft of your research question can still be too broad. If you use these five steps, um, it, it can help you refine it, really. So always evaluate before you go on with your question, evaluate it. You might have to evaluate it once or twice as well after you've made 
uh, a change, you want to evaluate it again using your five evaluation steps. And, and that's pretty much it. So for this week, we're focusing on using your two perspectives, thinking about what perspective, what approach you want to take, and creating a research question that relates to that approach or create a research question then deciding which approach you want to take okay bearing in mind you're, you're going to choose one or the other or the pragmatic approach okay so that's it for this week and i'll, I'll see you um again for next week i've added a, a book with, i've added some stuff with a bit more detail in extra reading so please give that a look but use this time to start thinking about your research question, OK? Sooner you've got that narrowed down, the sooner you can start gathering um, some research. And over the weeks, I'll be telling you how to use that. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with you starting to focus on a question now. OK, so that, that's your first thing for this week. OK, thank you. And I'll see you uh, in next week's slides.